Yeah, it's a lecture series, and uh, it is good to start from the beginning. Uh, yes. Very good. Many PhD students are there, and they are having different backgrounds. So, yeah. Yes. So it the, should the be most difficult kind of audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So the lecture is live streamed on uh, YouTube. So. Yeah, thank you. They must be watching that. On YouTube, so people can see at later right. on. Uh, so this, this lecture, I won't have transparency. The second lecture will have transparencies, and you can uh, you can get the slides later. Then. Okay. So this lecture is basically. Let me see. Can I share a screen? Yeah. I, yeah. Sure. Okay. Good. Could I just check? I mean, that I able to do that. So you say say now if I want to start. If if you want me to start. You can share. I think you can start. Maybe. Professor Manian, you can just check whether minutes. you are able to share the screen. Okay, good. So we start with uh, this here. All right. Yeah, it's fine. Yes, very good. You can see that? Yes. Yeah, yes. I can see that. Good. You are so, using Sage, right? Say it again. Are you using Sage Math or you are using just uh, Python Jupyter Notebook? So this is a Jupyter worksheet. Yeah. And you can start it easily from Sage. Yeah, right, right. I am oh. also one of the quite frequent user of Sage Math. So. I see. Good. Yeah. So uh, my first question is to you. I mean, uh, how many of you are using Sage? I'm definitely using. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I use anything. I mean, as you will see, I mean, uh, which works. Um, including Magma, Pari, GP, and other stuff, I mean, as well. So, yeah. good. So I have used the math Mathematica, but Sage being a free and open source, generally right. prefer sure. for the students. Good. So, if you want to start with Sage, I mean, you know, basically, I mean, you should start with a reference manual. And what I'm going to talk about today is basically a little introduction to what is written here. Let's see. Arithmetic subgroups of SL2Z. Right, right. And um, then about the ferry symbols, and basically that's it. Good. So, in, in fact, recently we also published one book on uh, group theory with Sage Math. So, that's a basic introductory book. Actually. Very good. <laughs> Very good. All right. So, okay, so um, I think we can uh, start, Professor Katre. Can oh, yes. you start? Uh, yes, we can uh, start. Yeah, okay. We can start. Very good. Okay. okay, so uh, uh, very good evening to all of you and thank you for uh, joining this uh, uh, lecture today. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Hartmut Temonian. He's a professor of theoretical physics at Beth Center for Theoretical Physics, Bonn University, Germany. And he's going to uh, talk on Bailey's map computation and basically he's going to discuss on computation of Bailey maps, modular forms, and functions of uh, non-convergence subspaces. And uh, uh, as we can see, he's going to uh, show us how these computations can be done in Sage's math, which is free and open source uh, software. It's becoming extremely popular among scientific community based on uh, Python programming language. So, and this uh, lecture is as a part of uh, year long series of lectures uh, of trimester program. Uh, and the theme of this uh, is triangle groups, Bailey's uniformization and modularity uh, organized by Bhaskaracharya Pratishthan Pune. And it's fun funded by Indian Mathematics Consortium and National Board for Higher Mathematics. So uh, let me welcome Professor Monian to deliver his talk. Professor Monian, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so the first thing I wanted to show is this, uh, uh, which is my Google Scholar account. And you probably have seen it. I mean, if you looked at it. And um, by the way, I would appreciate if I actually see faces. I mean, this is sort of in these times with, uh, you know, COVID and all of this, it's very sad. I mean, not to see people. And um, we have been lecturing to, you know, students of this size for a long, long time. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I would prefer to see you in person, but this is the best we can do at the moment. So 
you know, I grew up in theoretical physics and you can see that I did a number of things and probably you don't understand any of the, the titles which are written here. So in the same way, you should understand that if I say something which sounds stupid or is not profound and mathematically, uh, you should understand that I came from a different community, but I also did study, study mathematics. It's some time ago, but what can you do? All right, good. So here. So, uh, 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 sorry to interrupt, Professor Manian. If you could uh, zoom your uh, screen a little bit, then it would be better. Say it again. Uh, can you please zoom your uh, screen? Zoom. zoom. Enlarge like the it, screen. Make the font size a little bigger. Bigger. Okay, let's see. Um, maybe I think, yeah. Is but, that better? Yeah, this is bit, slightly better, but even bigger will be bit better. And this is well, not... it's, this is a, a, a large screen, actually. <laughs> right. Sorry, I mean, but I don't know, I mean, how, how to increase the screen size in Sage. Maybe yeah. I think you can, if you use Control Plus, then it may increase the font size. Okay, let's see if I... Um, no. No, it's not... Uh, I don't see. Anyway, please go ahead. Uh, no, and this is, I mean, the most you can it's do. okay. Maybe it's I can, I can yeah, yeah, this is better. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is, uh, I have to do it, I mean, individually then, I mean, for each page. So let's see if that works. Good. So um, why did I start out, I mean, to look at the ferry symbols, I wanted to have a, a tool for basically getting, um, you know, obtaining generators of subgroups of the modular group PSL2Z. And, um, what I wanted to have was the smallest set of possible generators. So um, the nicest reference I could find was the paper by, by Professor Kolkani, which was called, or is called, an arithmetic geometric method of study of subgroups of the modular group. So um, this paper is very readable and I recommend it highly to any of my students. And is, you know, in my view has some very nice features. Like for example, if you want to study any subgroup of PSL to Z and you want to, to um, check something analytically, you need to, when you need the generators, you want to work with the smallest possible subset and you will get that if you use this method. Now the implementation of that is actually on the surface done in Python under the hood, actually everything is written in, in C++. And um, that, um, required you know, a substantial amount of fudging between different kinds of software systems. But let me just walk through this, I mean, for, for you know, getting a little bit an idea of what this, this fairy, these fairy symbols are about. Well, in Sage, I mean, you can define subgroups of PSL to Z, in particular with congruent subgroups of PSL to Z relatively easily. So what you, what you just uh, say, if you want to have gamma 0, 11, for example, which is uh, the subgroup um, where the matrices in SL2Z, A, B, C, D, uh, C mod, mod 11 is zero, then you just say gamma zero 11 and write it up. So the ferry symbol um, of gamma zero 11 can be you know, basically obtained easily by, by uh, writing this uh, ferry symbol gamma zero 11 and then F. So the input to the ferry symbol is basically a group. Uh, and uh, the important point you need to know when you define uh, this group gamma 0, 11 or any other group is that it will be able to decide, I mean, if um, an element in SL2Z is actually in this subgroup. That's the only important thing you need to know. Good. Once you have that, that ferry symbol written down, all the computations which are needed to calculate the ferry symbol are already done and you can for example obtain the generators and this is the minimum set of generators you obtain if you if you follow the paper of Kulkani. Now um, here is another demonstration I mean you just have uh, the ferry symbols uh, you can calculate the index of that that um, particular subgroup of PSL to Z. Um, it is relatively trivial I mean to calculate you know, the generators of any other group. And here is a less trivial example, which actually, I mean, calculates the ferry symbol of a non-congruent subgroups. And I will subgroup. And I will explain that because 
I will need that very, very, uh, yeah, the, a, a substantial part of my calculation is calculating um, um, cosets and uh, generators of modular, uh, of subgroups of the modular group, which are non congruent Now, um, here is what I said before. I mean, if you want to, to calculate a Ferry symbol for any other group, I mean, then the ones which are defined in Sage, you basically can define a class which has to have a contains, which basically tells you that this matrix M is either in the group or not in the group. So if you want to define a Ferry symbol of, of a subgroup of PSL to Z, you basically have to define uh, this contains. And once you have the contains, I mean, you basically can can play the same games as before. You can just uh, generate the Ferry symbols with the corresponding generators, um, and that's it. Now, um, this is yet another particular example. I mean, I will I will explain that uh, in more detail later. Um, you, if you want to define a subgroup of the uh, um, of PSL to Z, you can either define it by, for example, congruences, but you can also define it by, by um, a set of permutations. Basically, what you do is um, you take uh, two permutations. If you talk only talk about PSL to Z, you take two permutations, one of order two, one of order three, and you can then define a subgroup of um, the uh, of PSL to Z via homomorphism, uh, which you can, which is implemented in Sage via this arithmetic subgroup permutation. And here is a particular example, and uh, you know we will see much of that later. So, um, what does a Ferry symbol give you? Well, I mean, you can obtain all the coset representation of the group. Uh, you can obtain the cusp class of a particular cusp of that group because. You, know, you have parabolic subgroups. These correspond to to cusps. These cusps um, are are uh, in stage defined by cusp, and which is numerator denominator. So cusp infinity would be, for example, one cusp one comma zero, and um, that defines the cusp class. So I will say more what that is later. Um, the cusp which is relatively clear. That's that's the size of the parabolic subgroups of the of the subgroup of PSL to Z, and in this particular case, I mean you you see, I mean that you have you have four cusps which which have the width six, two, three, and one. So all of this information is already contained in this in this um, in the Ferry symbol. Now cusp, I mean, basically gives you back the cusp of, I mean, yeah, the cusps which are stabilized by this this. Uh, the subgroup, and in this particular case, it's trivial to see that they are zero, one third, one one half in infinity. Now, fractions is um, more than what I more than the cusp. I mean, they belong to a particular kind of of uh, cusp class. Um, so, th the fractions of the Ferry symbol are basically the points at which the fundamental domain touches touches the real axis. Okay, so here's. Um, um, the command for obtaining the fundamental domain. And the fundamental domain is basically, I mean, you know, the one object you would like to know if you have a particular subgroup of PSL to Z, because that contains all of the information about the generators and all of the information about the cosets. So as I said before, I mean, you can, can obtain the generators, the genus, the index, the level, the number of elliptic points of order two and the number of elliptic points of order three and the paired sides. So here's an example of, of a particular fundamental domain. This is actually gamma zero 11, I would, I would claim. Um, and what I did was also to color the sides so that you easily can spot which sides are paired. So here you can see that, that on the left-hand side, there's a red line, I mean, which is, you know, um, corresponding to this uh, pairing at cusp infinity. So zero and five are paired, the paired side. So there's a generator in the group 
which pairs the side zero and five. Then there's a, a generator which pairs the side one and three and two and four. Okay, so um, to help you with, with identifying the sites, I mean, you can also just obtain the paired sites with paired sites, and that's that gives you the numbers in the order they are written in the ferry symbol. That would be zero, one, one, uh, one, two, three, and so Good. The pairing matrices are all the pairing matrices, meaning that um, if I want to translate, for example, this side to this side, I will I will have the generator um, of that um, pairing, which is one one zero one. Uh, if I want to pair this side with this side, I will have the matrix five minus one six minus one, uh, which gives you uh, the pairing between these two sides. All right. The TITS index I will not talk about because that's more complicated than I want to talk about today. The pairings, I mean, which are basically in the notation of 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 uh, Kurt, I mean, who who did write the first package in Python, which was you know sort of not so helpful. And then um, I will um, I will um, not uh, discuss I mean the odd and even pairings here in any more detail. But that was, you will see later. So one of the important points, I mean, which I will also talk to, about today is this reduced to cusp. So what does that do? Once you have obtained the ferry symbol from Sage, I mean, what this reduced to cusp says is it will give you a matrix which reduces any fraction or any cusp to a cusp in the fundamental domain. So if you take this cusp 5, 5, 8, this rational number 5, 8, the matrix 5 minus 3, uh, 12 minus 7 will reduce this cusp to the corresponding minimal cusp in gamma 0, 12. All right. And you can see that, that it actually does that. I mean, if you, if you take a more complicated example here, I don't know why I took this one. Uh, this is a very simple SU example 10. Um, where uh, basically um, you, know, you have the ferry symbol, you want to reduce this cusp 1117 to a, to a cusp in this uh, fundamental domain. Well, it gives you this, this uh, matrix. You take this matrix, this is the underscore. Uh, you act on 11 over 17, and it gives you the cusp, which is uh, one. And you can try the same thing here, and that you can see, I mean, that actually the cusp is actually one I mean, to which it is reduced. Now, then we come to the work problem, which I will explain, explain also a little bit more in detail later. So what you can do with this is basically um, take any element in, in SL2Z and reduce it uh, in, uh, and try to reduce it into generators of that group. So any particular, any particular element in that group can be decomposed again in, in, in generators of that group. And that is an extremely useful feature if you want to check, I mean, if, if you know, um, any matrix is in the group itself. Good, so this is just, I mean, you know, a run through of the documentation, which I wrote some time ago. Okay, so let me start here, um, the other stuff. Let's see if that works. Good. All right, so here is now a worksheet where one does actually these calculations. So what I wanted to, to help the students with is basically get used to this, this um, these very symbols. So gamma 0, 06 is a subgroup of PSL to Z. If in you which... could make it slightly bigger, the fonts. fonts. Okay, sure. Yeah. That Does that nice. help? Yes, yes, very nice. And if there's a, any question, let, you know, this talk is basically a more informal talk, I mean, where you can interrupt me at any time and, you know, please do so. I mean, if there's a question, you know, just tell me. So some of this is Pythonist, I mean, which, you know, not all mathematicians speak and not all mathematicians do computational stuff. So it might be more, more complicated than you, you would like. So gamma zero six is basically matrices uh, where, um, two by two matrices in SL2Z, where, which, which have the form A, B, C, D. 
the elements A, B, C, D, and C uh, is zero mod six. So it's um, here you see, I mean, it's a congruent subgroup of uh, PSL to Z. Now, um, this is, I mean, you know, if you want to know a list of what, what any of um, anything in any class in Python does, I mean, this is the spell, I mean, you have to write to get all the possible, you know, actions you can do on that, that element. And that's, I mean, what I just ran through. Now, what you obtain here is one of the most beautiful domains. I mean, basically um, by saying very simple fundamental domain tessellation equals none. So you don't want any tessellation. So that just gives you the fundamental domain without any, any tessellation or any um, indication where the cosines are sitting. Now, um, what you can see immediately without too much thinking is actually that the genus of that Riemann surface is zero because you can do Riemann Roch by hand if you pair the side, the red side with the red side, the blue side with the blue side, and the green side with the green side. So what you what you do is you basically close the shell, and you basically have a balloon. I mean, which has you know all sides glued to each other, and then there's a point at infinity which you compactify, and then you have a geno zero surface. Good. So. The paired side, I, I already said, I mean, that this is easy to calculate. So let's just, just do it differently here. So, so you can, so this, this is more fun so that you can actually see that it, it does work. So, so this is the ferry symbols. This is all the, um, this is the fundamental domain. Now, as promised, the paired sides, I mean, num numerated, enumerated in the way I, I just said. Uh, you can calculate the, the, the genus of that Riemann surface. Now, what you can also check is cosets. Now, one thing, and Professor Kalkani, you have to, to explain to me at one point in time. <laughs> the choice um, of a fundamental domain of the full modular group is sort of interesting here in this particular case because it contains two cusps. You see, let's, let's um, do something here. So let's just um, do F equals a very simple gamma zero one. So that's just the full material group. And if you look at the fundamental domain of that, that, uh, so what you can see here is it has two cusps. I mean, one is an infinity and one is basically zero. And sometimes that's not useful for some calculation. I will explain why. I mean, you, know, you have to deal with two cusps at the same time. That's the, trick, that's the tricky part if you want to do analytic number theory data. And that's what I'm going to do with that. But anyways, so, so if, you, if you calculate the fundamental domain with the tessellation coset, then basically what you see is the copies of the original fundamental domain of PSL to Z. And you see, and if you count, I mean, all the, the cosets, which you see here now, you basically can, can uh, find the number 12. So that's all you need to know, I mean, at this point. So the coset representations you can also get explicitly, oops, haha, because I calculated in between gamma zero one. Um, we have to redo the calculation. So otherwise, uh, yes. Good. So now the coset representations you can see are there are 12 cosets, and you know, this is a uh, the coset representation of what you see depicted up here. Then, I mean, the index is of course 12, I mean, because we have these 12 cosets. And the final tessellation, which I want to show is the standard Dedekind tessellation, which you know is historically the nicest one, which I, I know of. Now, and you calculate the pairing matrices, the generators, as I showed you before. And you see, this basically takes no time. Let me explain to you one, one little thing here. 
So if you look at, at implementation of ferry symbols, for example, in GAP or in Magma, then you will find, I mean, that um, the implementation of these ferry, um, of the ferry symbols in Magma and in, in GAP is very, very slow. In fact, I mean, I will show you in my second talk, I will show you a calculation where Magma basically doesn't give you an answer in the end. And the main point about this is uh, what you do when you, when you calculate the, the ferry symbol is basically what you are trying is to find the largest denominator, which gives you, um, you know, an element in the group all the time. And if you, if you go through that, um, then you see, I mean, that the relations between the, the cosets are basically two dimensional, meaning that, well, it's basically the, the, the fact that the Riemann surface is two dimensional. The relations are two dimensional. So you have, you have a two dimensional uh, net of relations between these cosets. That means that the algorithm in general will be n squared. So if you have an index n sub, subgroup, the, the calculation of the, the Ferry symbols is an n squared process. If you have a congruent subgroup, you probably know that there is, there is a representation of the cosets, which is due to money, which is sometimes called money trick, which basically gives you a one dimensional relation between, between the different cosets. It's most easily seen if, if you know, you have a, have a um, congruent subgroup like gamma 0, 013, where, you know, so that's the prime. And then you basically have a one dimensional coset, which you can produce by taking just um, continued fraction expansion of the denominators. And that is the money trick, I mean, for, for, for obtaining these one dimensional relations. In general, the relations are two dimensional, and we will see that in a minute. Okay, good. So then, I mean, you can also calculate the level, which is the generalized level of the subgroup in the sense of um, Wolfhard. I mean, so there's a, a nice paper by Wolfhard uh, about the, the generalized level concept. I can point you to that if you need that. Now, the cusps, as I said, are already calculated when, when, you, when you have called the ferric symbol and the cusps which are easily obtained. So let's take some random rational number. Uh, so this is a, you know, an element in Q and let's reduce that to a cusp. So to which cusp is this equivalent, equivalent to? And this, I mean, basically you find the matrix and then you can take the, the matrix and have it act on on one third. So this rational number C, which I, which I wrote down here, is equivalent to one third. So that's easily seen by, by doing this level calculation. So how is that done? Well, I mean, the first thing you need to do is, is um, reduce this, this, um, this cusp um, to well, I mean, basically what you do is you calculate something which I call Rademacher matrix, which is, you know, basically a congruence, a solution of a congruence, which pulls back the cusp to infinity. And then you check, check in which coset this matrix actually sits. And that is enough to basically calculate this action, uh, this matrix, which I wrote down here. Okay, so then, once you have calculated that, I mean, you can check, I mean, that the cusp class, so meaning the cusps are enumerated from zero to um, the number of cusps. I mean, so you can basically minus one. Um, so you can basically check, I mean, that, you know, C and this one third are actually in the same cusp. And that means that this reduction to the cusp has actually succeeded in finding the element, uh, the, the original cusp, I mean, from which you can, can take it by an element in the group. So here, let's just add one thing here. Uh, this is not so good, helpful, sorry. I have to do it like this. Um, so one thing you can check is that R, this element which we 
we calculate has to be in the group. And that means it's in the ferry symbol. So that's sort of the helpful thing to, to remember. So now I take a random element in SL2Z. So that's my random element. And then I can check if this random element is in, in F. So, I mean, there's a membership test in this um, built in, into this ferry symbol, which I will discuss a little bit maybe later. Okay, here. So what I did here is I just start generated, you know, up to a hundred random elements in SL2Z. And then I just checked, I mean, which one, which of those is in, in uh, uh, gamma 06, in fact. And here you can see, I mean, the fourth element is already in gamma 06, and you can see 18 mod, mod 6 is zero. So that's actually true. Good, so this is, I mean, you know, uh, just an introduction of how to use ferry symbols, not really how, how they are implemented. And if you would like to know more details about that, I'm happy to say something about it, but it's very, very technical if you want to go through that. Okay, I, at this point, I would like to skip it. And this, I mean, probably suffices to understand, I mean, how to use these ferry symbols to do the calculation if you want to. All right. So then let's go back here. Uh, where is this other thing? So, uh, can I just uh, ask you a very simple th thing, Professor Monian? Yeah, you can ask uh, very simple things. You can also ask very complicated Yeah, no, so I mean, just uh, because, uh, so once you have created this F, so yes. all the methods that you can apply on F, it's uh, just F dot tab will give or it's not? Say it again, it's uh, F. Once you have created this object f, yes, then f dot, and then if you press tab, it lists all the methods or? Yes, uh, this will give you all the methods. Yeah, right. So then we don't have to remember any of these things, all these things. No, that's true. That's true. It would be yeah. sort of uh, cumbersome to remember all these. Right, right, yes. So, I mean, okay. and this so is helpful, see, I mean, if you want to do a calculation, yes. Yeah, that's why, I mean, so those who are not using say, this is very, I mean, it's not difficult to use, that's what. Yeah, no, it's not difficult. And as I said, there's very good documentation of how to use it. So at this point, I mean, is, are, there, are there more questions? Yes, I would like to ask another question. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, you said we can calculate the membership of the Perry symbol. Yeah. Uh, does that just use the membership of the group we put in, or is that in? Yeah, in that's the, the membership of the group. But it's just kind of passed on. So that's that's the helpful thing. thing. And um, okay, the person who was here some minute ago, I mean, Mr. Tan, I mean, actually wrote a very nice paper of how to use, you know, how to geometrically find out if, if you are in the group or not. That's imp implemented under the hood in the in the ferry symbols. So, yeah. Mr. Tan, are you here? Yeah, Tan is here. Professor Tan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. I'm here. Yeah, I, I was muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. This, so, this is I mean, fascinating. I, I don't know how to do any computing, so it's fascinating to see all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, your paper was very helpful in implementing this membership test. Okay, yeah. So, you see, I mean, for me, mathematics is very concrete. It's you know, not abstract in, in in many ways. So if I do, if I don't know how to deal with the mathematical symbol, then you know what do I know? So it's up, you know for me playing with these things is very important. Right, right, right. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So and it gives you intuition, and, and you know sometimes there's not enough information of the things you would like to know in mathematics, and then it's helpful to have some, you know, playground. Yeah, I mean this 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 really looks uh, fantastic to me. Uh, but like I say, I am uh, pretty useless with uh, computing. <laughs> yeah, no, well, don't worry about it. So let's go back to this here. Um, okay, so one thing one could notice, I mean, is is if you look at at the fundamental domain here, is that you know you see that these fundamental domains are attached to each other, and in fact, I mean, there are two elements, I mean, which generate the full modular group. You can either choose something uh, which is just 
um, the inversion at the unit circle or the translation by one uh, to generate the full modular group, or you can take uh, some other generators. We will, we will discuss that in a minute. Um, but basically, I mean, the, the connection between these cosets is giving you something which I would call a Kelly graph. Now, the one thing, I mean, you, know, you can also see with this coset <laughs> representation is if you multiply this coset from the right with uh, one of the generators of the group, then, I mean, of course, you will permute the, the cosets. Now, then it is extremely useful to find out, I mean, um, in which coset you land, I mean, once you once you multiply from the right or from the left, depending on what you want, um, with a generator from the full group. That process will give you, in fact, a permutation representation of your group. So let me let me show you in Sage, I mean, which you know, I mean by that. So gamma zero six, I mean, if you just type it like that, well, you know, there's not much you can see, I mean, from that, but. Let's, so let's call G gamma zero six. So we will talk about gamma zero six for a while because that's, I think, you know, in, an object which is easy to understand comparatively. So then, I mean, um, you know, you can just, I mean, do this. And what does this, this uh, do in Sage? Well, it calls the ferry symbols. It does, just doesn't tell you that it uses the ferry symbols. So under the hood, I mean, Sage uses the ferry symbols to calculate the generators. If you just type gamma zero six as, as, as um, yeah, good. Then, um, so, I mean, what we can do, for example, just test, I mean, if, if all of these um, elements are in, in the group. So what I say is lambda x, that's a lambda function uh, in f, and then I map it over the generators and it sh should be all true. Okay, good. So, but you know, if you have a more general group than just the congruence group, I mean, how do you do that? Well, um, there's a command which tells you as a permutation group. Okay, so what does that do? Well, before we had 12 cosets, and as you can see, I mean, this S2 and S3, L and R are just elements of the permutation group of 12 elements. Okay, and so what this does is basically, um, tell you what happens to the cosets if you multiply them with the generators from the right or from the left. Which generators do I mean? Well, S2 would be, would be a matrix which um, um, would be like this. Um, and you know, this is the one which you use in the homomorphism to the uh, to the permutation group when you want to represent this in this theorem by Millington and, and Ashford. So then, I mean, the, the other element, which um, S3 would be something like this. I mean, let's, let's try this one. Okay, that's an element in SL2Z. And so if I take that to the power three, you see again, I mean, in PSL2Z, this is one. All right, can you see that? So what what this uh, what I'm saying here is take the coset representation of um, the of gamma zero six, take the coset representative, multiply it with this matrix um, S two, and then look at which in which um, in which coset you land, and that will give you exactly these permutations. So as you have learned before in, in one of the lectures, I think when, when somebody talked about the, the theorem by Millington, you can define a subgroup of PSL to that either by defining um, a congruence or by defining two permutations 
which I have to be, we have to generate a transitive group, uh, one of order two and one of order three. That's enough to specify the group, the subgroup of, of PSL to Z. And that I will use heavily in my talk. Okay. Good. So this is uh, one thing. Then I want to show you um, more advanced um, application of um, um, these very symbols. Okay. So there's a, an ancient paper by, by Seelander where they define two permutations. And um, these two permutations define a permutation group. Okay. And they do a homomorphism to PSL to Z using these two elements. Okay. Good. So then, um, well, I mean, I can define these, these permutation elements in Sage, I mean, like this. I can generate, uh, look at gamma two, I mean, which you know, is just here. This is the ferry symbol for gamma two. And then let's try, I mean, uh, let's just do the calculation. So this is uh, part number one. So these are the three generators of gamma two. And then I define the matrices as given in the paper by, by Selander and, and Stromberg-Song. Now, what, what is the aim of that? What I want to do is I want to de define this permutation group, which is given by T0 and T infinity as a quotient of a subgroup of gamma two. So I have given a permutation group, a finite simple group. So gamma two, as you, as you know, is basically infinity, infinity, infinity as a triangular group. All the angles are infinity. That means any finite group, any simple finite group, I can represent as a quotient of gamma two. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is to construct that subgroup of, of gamma two, which has as a quotient, this permutation group. Okay, that's not trivial enough, I hope. <laughs> okay, good, well, so here, is my, here are the generators and here I've defined the two elements. Now, how do I do that? Well, basically I define a class H which has a contains. So how do I define this contains? Well, if my element X is not in, in F2, which is this very symbol for gamma two, then I, I'm not in the group anyways. So an element which is not in gamma two doesn't belong there. It cannot be an element of that. So then um, I define P as, as the one element in the permutation group. And then I do something interesting. What I solve is the word problem in gamma two. So I take the element X of PSL to Z and decompose it in a word in gamma two, in the generators of gamma two. And then I, I require this to fix the one when mapped to the permutations via the homomorphism. Okay. And then all you need to do after doing, uh, after defining it, this contains this way, is to calculate the Fary symbol of F. And once you have that, you have all the information of F. F 
you know, gives you all the information about the subgroup of PSL to Z, which as a quotient with gamma two, gives you the permutation group above. Okay, maybe I should have given one single talk on this subject. I don't know. I mean, this is obvious or is it is it helpful in, for some in some ways? Okay, so I run through this example again. I mean, so I have a permutation group and I want a subgroup of, of gamma two, which as a quotient has exactly this permutation group. And that's it. That's how to define it. So then you can find the cusp, you can find, find um, all the, the, the things you want need uh, to know about this particular group. So this is uh, is my one example which I want which I thought is sort of a non-trivial example of an application of the very symbols. Now for the talk um, I will I I need a few more things. All right what I'm going to tell you a little bit more about is Kelly graphs. Or were there, were there any questions concerning this last example? This was probably a little bit too advanced or for the students, but I mean, I thought it's sort of interesting to see, I mean, how one can define a quotient of gamma two. So um, here, let's look at gamma zero two. And I, I labeled the cosets one, two, three. And um, when I look at the generators of the modular group, I mean, S2 and S3 actually generate the, the modular group, um, then I can give relations between these matrices. So if I apply uh, to the coset one, I apply S2. If I apply to the coset two, I apply S2. So I can, I can uh, picture that in a graph. This is the Kelly graph of that particular permutation group. So S2, uh, sigma two corresponds to the blue arrows, uh, sigma three corresponds to the red arrows. So gamma, gamma zero two as a Kelly graph looks like this. So, I mean, in fact, this is a, a design if you want, but it's a little bit more, more elaborated. So the, uh, the three red arrows would correspond to a black dot in a design. And you would have to to uh, connect one and two with a with an um, with just one line, and you would have an extra line for uh, connecting three again. I mean, which is basically the sigma two, the involution. So, okay. So this is the simplest example I can think of, and gives you the relation between these these different cosets. And this um, this three, you see has an element of order two, which connects to itself. And you can see that here. So here's the elliptic point of order two, here's the elliptic point of order three, and three connects itself by a, by a sigma two. And that's just the elliptic point of order two, which you know, pairs these two sides, pairs the side to itself, if you wish. Now, um, then, I mean, you can, can uh, look at different groups and you can see, look at the, the Cayley graphs and that gives you a lot of information, in fact. And um, from the Cayley graph alone, I mean, you can see quite, quite a bit. In particular, I mean, you, know, you can basically read off the design directly from that. Now, why is that interesting? Well, uh, having a Riemann surface of, of genus zero basically corresponds to saying that this, this, this graph, this Cayley graph is embeddable, is planar. So now I want to come to more complicated groups and that will be discussed later in the talk. So what I want to mention here is at least a theorem by Kai Maga. So, I'm not sure. I mean, has any of you have 
met Kai Maga. All right. Um, he was the cousin of my wife. He passed away much too early, but I mean, we had many discussions about the subject. And so I came to the subject via him. So there's a theorem by Kai Margaret, which is in this paper, which I can give you a reference to if you want, uh, which says the following. Um, well, do you know, let G denote a finite sporadic group, finite simple group, then there exists a Riemann surface X of genus zero and a non-constant meromorphic function phi such that G is a composition factor of the monotomy of X phi uh, exactly when G is isomorphic to M11, so Mathieu group 11, Mathieu group 12, Mathieu group 22, and so on. So the Mathieu groups are, um, and all of these groups are finite simple groups, but they do not fit in this classification scheme of Veit and Thompson. So they belong to the sporadic groups. Now the two groups I will pick out from in my talk is our, uh, Hall, the hall Yanko group, the so-called Yanko two group and Conway three. There is a particular reason for that, which I will explain. So these particular groups, Yanko two and Conway three are actually um, coming from a particular lattice, which is the Leach lattice. And that's an unimodular even lattice in 24 dimension with the densest packing. And in fact, uh, Hall Yanko stabilizes 100 lines in the Leach lattice. And you know, if you want to know more information about it, you have to look at the atlas of finite simple groups. And then you see, I mean, that you know, Hall Yanko is not that large. I mean, the, actually, um, the order is, is um, a little bit more than half a million. And you see the factors here. And so there's a lot of information about, about Hall Yanko. And, um, what you can see here also is that there is a generator of order two in the presentation, in the semi-presentation. Um, you can see that there is um, a presentation which has uh, two elements, one of order two and one of order three and one of order seven. So it's actually a Hobbit's group. And you can find Yanko two as a quotient. You can define Yanko two as a quotient of the modular group. That's sort of the interesting fact, which you can read off directly from this, this presentation here. So A, B, one of is the order of A is two, the order of B is three. So we can use a homomorphism to sigma two and sigma three to basically define a quotient, the uh, Yanko two as a quotient of the modular group. Good. So now going back, um, what I what I show here now is the Cayley graph of Yanko two with two generators, one of order two and one of order three. Okay, so the amazing contents of the paper by Kai Marga is that this Cayley graph corresponds to a Riemann surface which has genus zero. For me, I mean, that's one of the more, most amazing things I ever heard of. When you look at this, this Cayley graph, I mean, it's unimaginable to me. I mean, with that, you know, the quotient of that group, you know, is, is, uh, is a permutation group of, um, you know, 100 elements. So, I mean, you have an index 100 subgroup of PSL to Z, uh, which you can denote by these uh, two generators, um, which you can you know, define by these two generators. And, this Cayley graph is basically embeddable in genus zero. Okay, good. Now, uh, the other group I'm going to talk about is Conway three, and that's an even larger um, um, group. So if we just look at the Atlas, you can see it has approximately five times 10 to the 11 elements. So what I'm going to do is to define a subgroup of the modular group by two permutations, one of order two and one of order three. And this subgroup has a Riemann surface, which has genus zero. 
So if you look at the Kelly graph, I mean, that's sort of not so obvious, I mean, from, from my perspective. Okay, but anyway, so let me just show you also that you can do a Kelly graph of, um, in terms of S and T, I mean, so just the inversion and oh, the involution and, and the translation. And then you can see, I mean, that basically you see the cycles. I mean, this, these are more or less the cusps. I mean, so here you see that there's uh, a three cycle, here's a two cycle, here's a six cycle, and here's a one cycle. So this corresponds to the cusp of order one, uh, of width one, this is the cusp of order of width six, this is the cusp of width three, and this is the cusp of width two. So you see a lot of information directly from these, these Cayley graphs, which are you know, basically generated by, by these ferric symbols. So gamma zero seven has a very nice simple picture. So you have just the cycle of, uh, of uh, order seven. This is, I mean, the red arrows are T and the blue arrows are the involution. So here you can see, I mean, you have a cusp of with one and one cusp of with uh, one of with one and one of with seven. All right, good. So then um, one more thing, I mean, this is M24, which is a little bit more complicated. You, M, the Mathieu group 24 has a representation, uh, has a permutation representation uh, with, as the subgroup of S24. And so here you can see that actually, I mean, the mature group has a, has a cycle um, which with of length 23. And then, I mean, it has one of with one. So one cusp with, with one and one with, with 23. So let, let me come back to the ferry symbol step. And I, I'm not sure you envisioned this when you were, when you were writing this paper on, on ferry symbols. But here, so let's take two permutation group elements. So this is S2 and S3. Uh, so one permutation of, all, you know, of order three, one permutation of order, order uh, two. So, and then you can define with Sage an arithmetic subgroup via this permutation that does exactly, you know, solve the word problem, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not going to say much more about it here. And then um, once you have that, you can write down the ferry symbol. And this is the fundamental domain of the subgroup of PSL to Z, which has as a quotient M24. This is the simplest example I can, can think of. And you will see, I mean, in fact, um, that you, you, know, you can actually use this, I mean, to calculate the value map in the end. Now, um, if you look at this Riemann surface, um, you see, I mean, you have a pairing between the left side and the right side. And then you have a lot of elliptic points of order three. I mean, all of these elliptic points of order three are down here. And you pair these two sides, 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 you pair these two sides. You pair these two sides. So you have genus zero. And um, so as I said, no, cost, uh, no, no elliptic points of order two, no elliptic points of order three, zero. And then here, let's, let's look at the cusp width. And then you see, I mean, that basically the, all the information was already in the permutations. Okay, so this, this, this is it. And then A, uh, let's see the permutation group. So you can obtain the permutation group from this arithmetic. So this is the permutation group. And if you want to check, I mean, that this actually um, permutation group is, as I promised, M24. Um, you can ask gap for this, and it will tell you that it is M24. And one thing which is now important is that if you ask, I mean, if this group is a congruent subgroup, there's a test implemented in Sage and it will tell you it's not. So now, you know, the, the simple question I could ask you is, um, well, this is the Riemann surface of genus zero. And 
there must be exactly one generator of the function field of modular functions on that Riemann surface. How does it look like? And because, I mean, we, we have no way of uh, without without hacker operators and all this machinery, we have no simple way of calculating this, this help module. Um, we have to develop some new techniques. And in the last five minutes, um, I'm going to show you one thing which seems to be unrelated, but you will see in my next talk that it in fact has um, very, very, <laughs> profound impact for this, for my talk. Okay. Let me um, explain to you. So is this good? Is this readable? Yes. Yeah, this is fine. Good. So let's assume, I mean, that we want to solve the Laplace equation for phi on the domain omega and with some function on the boundary, so directly boundary conditions. And as smooth as you wish, but directly boundary conditions. So this is already a non-trivial task, I mean, if you want to, to uniformize that domain. And in fact, Schwarz had a very ingenious idea, which I like very much, and this long, long, long time ago. But you know, it turns out turned out to be useful for the things which I'm going to tell you next, next time. Okay, so what he, what he said is basically, well, I mean, there are, in this domain, there are two simple domains which I can think of. One is a rectangular domain and one is a circular domain. And what I could do is basically calculate, calculate the Laplace the solution of the Laplace equation in the simpler domain by, for example, series expansion in in you know some spherical um, uh, in some cylindrical harmonics in the circle, and I can calculate um, the solution of the Laplace equation by some series expansion in omega one. So omega one is the rectangle, omega two is is the circle. Now what? What are you missing? Well, I mean, if, if I calculate the solution of the uh, in omega two, then I, I would need to know what the value of the function is here to solve the complete problem. But I don't have that solution yet. So what I'm going to do is basically uh, ignore, ignore the boundary condition here and just set it to zero in the first step. So what I'm going to do is basically solve the, the um, boundary problem in in the circle with this boundary with the red boundary set to zero now once i've i've done that i have a solution in the in omega 2 then what i'm going to do is i will solve the problem the same problem for omega 1 but this time because I've already calculated a solution of the Laplace equation with the wrong boundary condition, but inside, inside omega two, I have some function value here in omega two. So I can now solve the, the, the Dirichlet problem in omega one with the function values defined by the solution in omega two of the Laplace equation in omega two. Good. That seems to be sort of, you know, uh, ad hoc solution. But what you actually can do is alternate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what Schwarz was able was able to show was actually that this process, um, matching these two solutions, actually converges to the solution of the uniform. Uh, of, of the Laplace equation in the union of omega one and omega two. So this is a piece of applied mathematics, which you might not be aware of, but it's extremely useful in, in terms of analytic number theory. Mm -hmm. And in fact, 
now when you want to transfer to what I what I was showing you before is that you should replace um, these omega one and omega two basically by by uh, domains attached to the cusp. So what you do here, I mean, in in very crude words, what you do is an analytic continuation from the from the this part of omega one to this part of omega two. You do a numerical analytic continuation, and exactly the same thing you can do by overlapping the cusp expansion from each cusp. All right. So I would need to go to my my um, um, other machine. I mean to to actually show that. I mean, but let's see. I mean, if I can try to do it here. So, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, yes, that works. Good. So what I'm going to show is now a terminal where I basically implemented this process um, for um, fundamental domains of the modular group. So exactly this Schwarzen, Schwarzen uh, domain decomposition. Um, let me see where can I, yes, there. Oh, so that, does that work? Yes, you see a terminal, right? Yeah, yeah we can see the terminal. This time it's big enough. So I just run the main. So it asks, asks me for a level. And what I'm going to show you first is, uh, OK, what did I do? I did exactly this Schwartz process using a cusp expansion at cusp 1 and cusp, and only at cusp 1. And I, I well, I'll, I'll, I'll draw a picture in a second. So and it also works you know, at higher. If, if I take a different level, so this is gamma zero two, I mean, you can see, I mean, that it calculates the modular function in no time by just doing the Schwarzschild Schwarzen process. I mean, so behind the scene, I mean, is, is the Schwarzschild process, which I just showed you. Good, so you need more explanation for, for this. So let me just try, I mean, to um, do this here. See if that works. Yes. So now I hope to be able to draw. Uh, okay. Yes, it should work, but we'll see. I mean, that, yes. So what I was doing here was the following. So for for gamma. Um, for the full modular group. So let's say, I mean, this is my fundamental domain from minus one half to one half. This is the real axis. This is the imaginary axis. Um, this is I. And this is um, S U, the elliptic points of order three. So this would be one plus I square root three divided by two. Um, so what did I do? Well, what I was doing it was actually calculating at some, ah, oh, geez, sorry. At some height, I, um, so this um, is at heart, height one half. Um, I calculated the function values down here. Well, in the beginning, I, I have no function values at all to, to talk about for so solving this equation. So uh, slow, slow, slow. I'm, I'm over time already, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This whatever you want. Yeah, yeah you could take it's very interesting. Say, say it again. Yeah, you could take a few more minutes. 
Okay, so point number one. Uh, what does it mean for a function to be analytic? It means that the real and imaginary part obey a Laplace equation. That's what's the meaning of the Schwarzschild uh, domain decomposition. That, that is why I brought the Schwarzschild domain decomposition up. Okay. And um, so if you want to do analytic number theory, it's useful to remember analyticity just means that you need to solve a partial differential equation if you want to calculate a function. Okay, so then um, if I look at any of the Hopf modules, um, and let's only talk about um, subgroups of BSL to Z, which have you know a cusp of width one, then the Hopf module can always be written um, at uh, as 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 the cusp expansion at infinity uh, like this. And Q is just e to the two pi i z, right? That's the expansion at infinity. Okay, so now this cusp expansion, if I don't know the coefficients, then I, I still know one thing. I'm dominated by this point at at zero, so down here. Any rational number will basically map this one over Q and will diverge. And what I'm doing now is basically take this line and pull it back to the fundamental domain. So, so what it means is that basically my my line is equivalent to this cycle. And with that, I can calculate with any of the cusp expansions or starting with just one over Q, I can calculate, calculate what the values down here are. And then I use this again to calculate the first Fourier coefficient by, because now I will have some function values down here and that will basically determine what's happening up there. So um, probably I'm too much under pressure. I mean, to explain it in five seconds and I give up at this point and we'll try to explain this in more detail later. So next one. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh... Did you talk in Bailey map how it corresponds from those groups, subgroups, and the ferret symbols? Say it again. Uh, how to get a jet Bailey map from those ferret symbols that you ah. started? Yes. Well, um, that's that's why I'm giving a second talk. Okay. <laughs> the point is, I've shown you only I'm the combinatorics of how to get from the group, I mean, to basically this uh, subgroup of PSL to Z, and then basically uh, get all the information you need about, about the subgroup for calculating a fundamental domain and so on. So that was done with these very samples. But now what you need to do is calculate the help module of that particular group you are interested in. And if you look at the value of the Hopf module at the elliptic points, I will explain that this gives you an approximation for the zeros of the polynomials, which are in the belly map. And I will use that as a starting point for improving the accuracy analytically to any accuracy you would like. And that's the content of my next talk. I will basically explain that, that you can use the information of the, of, of the help module to obtain, obtain an approximation for the algebraic equation you're supposed to solve when discussing the belly map. 
So this was only a technical introduction for you know understanding some part of it, but but already that I mean was much too long for, for my taste. <laughs> I'm okay. my, I'm sorry, I mean I was trying to put too much into this, and and I you know. It was very I, elaborate I, talk and very good talk. Sorry. It was very elaborate and good talk for the no, audience. No, I think we, we we understood it. Yeah. We understood part of it. Yes. Uh, I, so. Yes, sir. You have this uh, hairy symbol for a subgroup, yep. and you have this permutation representation. Yes. So, uh, uh, do you have clear algorithms to go from one to the other and from the other to the one? Yes. Well, I mean, if if you okay, if you have uh, a subgroup, I do. Let's that's that's uh, my simple answer. I can go from one to the other. That's the point. So and, from, I mean, the, from the fairy symbol to the uh, permutation representation, I can see somewhat. Yeah. But from the permutation representation, you can just routinely go to the fairy symbol? Right. Well, I mean, the point is, I mean, what you do, what you need to do is to solve the word problem. I, 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 I yes. avoid going into this. Yes. So, I mean, what you basically do is, I mean, you, you can, for example, use Todd Coxeter. Um, as an algorithm for building up the coset. And the only question you basically ask every time is, is if, if you're, you're in the stabilizer of one. So, you know, you do the homomorphism every time you add an element, you ask, I mean, if, if, if it's in the stabilizer of one or not. And once, you know, once um, you have built up the coset, I mean, with Todd Coxeter, then you can play the same games as before. I mean, you can just apply a generator of the full group. I see. And that gives you the permutation representation again. Right. Do, do you okay. have some expository account of this? Uh, what uh, is going from backwards from backwards and forwards? <laughs> yeah, well, um, the evil thing I, 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 I've, I've done is to write everything I did in Haskell. I mean, and that's not a very popular language. Which language? Uh, uh, it's called Haskell. It's a functional language. It's a provable language. Nice. That's why I like it. But it's it's sometimes, I mean, you know, let me just show you then one piece of, of the code, I mean, which you know, does, for example, this word decomposition, if you would, if you like. Yeah, so that Haskell you're uh, calling through the stage, or what is it? No, I mean this is this is a separate project which I'm doing basically more or less on my own, and uh, uh, so this is um, yeah. What can I? Say? <laughs> uh, this is a, a major project, and you know I'm trying to, trying to write something which is more or less you know a successor to Pari GP, which is not that trivial. I mean, if you want to include because. What I need in, in my, my uh, in my uh, field is basically I need the analytic part as well as the as the arithmetic and algebraic part, and that's sort of difficult. In magma, you you don't have the analytic part, and in Sage, I mean you know, it's it's not that easy to combine the two. And so let's see, I mean, if I can show you here what I wanted. Uh, just a sec. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so here are some. All right, so I show you this. And at some point in time, I would like to actually publish this on some, some um, you know, GitHub, whatever, so that people can actually look at it. So this is all you need in Haskell. It's much shorter than Sage or any of this. And it's more mathematically if you want. So I define the data type, which is ST, which is either S or T. I mean, and then you, you know, here is, is the homomorphism, how to go from one to the other. That's all you need. And here's, I mean, from the word and to the word, I mean, depending what you, what you want to do. It's very short. I see. 
it's not not such a hard problem in in fact i mean to do it this way so here you basically see i mean it's is more or less a pullback algorithm um, but i mean by pullback is basically you want to pull pull your 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 complex uh, value into the fundamental domain of the of PSL to Z, right? And that's that's this part here. I mean, if you can see my mouse. And once you have that, that's that's off. I mean, you, it's, it's not that hard. Yeah. So next time we'll be in orderly talk with slides. <laughs> <laughs> and a beginning and an end. <laughs> so, and I, I was sort of uh, puzzled by this question. I mean, if I can, in, you know, show some some uh, demonstration, but I, I think it's extremely useful for anybody, any working mathematician, to have that knowledge and see what you can do. And it's uh, yeah, and probably I should also write show you one little thing here. Let's check. I mean, if I can show you. So this is. Uh, Shameless self-advertising, but you should know. <laughs> um, let's see if I can share it. So there's a new book by, by Henri Cohn, which is called Numerical Algorithms in Number Theory, which I like very much. And the thing which I like best about it, as you can probably see here, it has a chapter on something which I I, I invented. And you know, if you are in the same same sentence as Lagrange, I mean, then I think you're done. <laughs> there is something. I mean, Euler, McLaurin, Avoplala, Lagrange, and Monin summation. So there's a chapter on my 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 stuff there, which is numerical algorithms. So my strength is really these algorithms. And you will see next time, I mean, a calculation which basically shows you um, what can be done nowadays. I mean, this, uh, you know, John Foyt and I have, have met many, many times at conferences and um, he's still impressed with what I can do in my little calculations. So, um, and, you know, the reason why I, I was talking about Yanko 2 and Yanko um well we can talk about the code i mean some not today now uh, i will say something about it but um so uh it's relatively hard to to do the calculation in fact i mean if you go to these very large groups and i show you why i mean ne next time and then um, we we can talk about it some more is this coming from any physics problem or your no this no, no, no. Um, see, um, I was drawn into mathematics by by Don Zagier. So I was I was bragging about some summation algorithm which is faster than Euler McLaurin and any other algorithm I knew. And he said, "What's the problem?" And then he, he I I showed him the problem. I mean, it's a very simple problem which you you can try yourself. It comes from uh, from the circle method. So, uh, if you, what people wanted to estimate was uh, a sum, and they wanted to have a lower bound. And the sum is very simple. It's uh, the sum of uh, sine x divided by k, and that whole thing divided by k. So that's something which comes up in, you know, in some number theory problem. And what they wanted was, was an estimate of that sum for a very large x. So let's say x a million. And that sum is an evil sum because it oscillates very, very rapidly. And you know, numerically, this is impossible to do, I mean, easily. And then there was uh, an article by an expert who, was, uh, who wrote an article in, um, in uh, Abramowitz and Schlegun, you know, and has many books on computational methods. And he said, well, you need over a thousand points. I mean, to calculate it at x equals 44, at least an accuracy of 10 to the minus four. And then I found a method which exactly needed 14th evaluation of the sum to calculate it to machine precision. 
Yes. Well, <laughs> I thought, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> that's something. So I was bragging to Don Zagir and then he pulled me, uh, he, he, I, I told him the problem, he, he ran away. It, you know, he didn't even introduce himself. He just said, what's the problem? And ran away after that. And then um, two weeks later, I got a phone call from, from, from Don Zagir and he asked me to come to the Max Planck Institute and said, you know, you should do something more serious than physics. <laughs> <laughs> so he had tried to improve on my my algorithm and he found for that particular example he found some something which is faster but he said my stuff is much more general and and actually i mean it ha has some very deep understanding of you know that euler mclaurin summation is really something like gaussian integration over uh over discrete measure and blah 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 so that was something interesting and then um, you know, one thing led to another. And then I wanted to understand a little bit about modular forms. Then I, I was talking to the cousin of my wife. He was explaining to me about his work on, on the sporadic groups. And then, you know, I said, what's the Hauptmodul? And he said, nobody knows. And I said, well, somebody should. <laughs> and so, so I started to work on that. And, um, you know, I'm handicapped by the, by the fact that, you know, my, my mathematics education is ancient. I mean, so, you know, I, I studied a long, long time ago, but, but you know, Don claims, Don Zagier claims himself that he is a, you know, a 19th century mathematician. So I think I'm in good, I'm in good company. So <laughs> <laughs> he appreciates me. And so that's, that's good enough for me. I mean, that, so, you know, in physics, I've done enough, I mean, to be, be well known. And I mean, if you ask your colleagues in your physics department, they might know me. So, uh, and I have some very nice Indian colleagues, I mean, with whom I have been working. I mean, I worked with Rajiv Singh at some point in time, who's at Davis, I, and uh, yeah, no, there are quite a number of people from India I've worked with, and, but not in mathematics. And so this is the first time <laughs> I have contact with India in mathematics, and I'm very, very happy to see you, Professor Kolkani. I mean, I'm finally. So I- You are a great mathematician also with the name uh, Ravindra Kulkarni. Oh, uh, that's one. Yeah, but sometimes our papers are uh, they start are, together. <laughs> I see. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there is actually another Munin, I mean, in Germany, who is a computer scientist. And yes, he's and there 